In 2016, architect Sadia presented a paper in Dakum conference in, Sla in Istanbul, Turkey for the Conference of City Planning and Urban Design. In 2018, she presented her paper at IPEX Lahore for the forum Architourism. In 2018, she also won the Young Architects Design Competition to design sustainable, portable living spaces held by IAP Islamabad. Currently, she is working as a freelance architect in her own firm. Bismillah ar-Rahman uh, ar-Rahim. The folklore of Aladdin is about an Arab street urchin who met a princess, daughter of Sultan of Agrabah. The story is retold as a fairy tale that we have been falling asleep to ever since childhood. Ali Baba is another one of these tales where Ali Baba manages to get a hold of the treasures and ingeniously escapes 40 thieves. These stories have been told and retold from the famous book Arabian Nights, which have been set in the Arabian landscape that made a part of everyone's childhood and made one ponder, dream and wonder about the land of the unknown, the land of the Arabs. Was this place a figment of our imaginations where either magic prevailed or mysteries took over the realities of our lives? Or were these dwellers magicians who lived in a mysterious desert hiding treasures underneath the sand where caravans traveled miles on camels? Arabia is the land of imagination and wonder. It is the same land where Lawrence, a British soldier, once had to overcome obstacles one after the other, even after being on the side of Prince Faisal, to finally conquer cities against the Turks around the World War I. So it was not a figment of our imagination, but reality existing in a very different setting. Reading about these myths and legends, it drew a picture of a land which was unfamiliar. It somehow drew the reader close, closer to its setting, but its daunting terrain and unfamiliar territory. This made one hesitant to a degree as well. While growing up, these narratives were a regular, daily, regular in my daily life, drawing a parallel universe to my mundane everyday routine. Little did I know that from the girl fancying Aladdin, listening to Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, and reading Lawrence of Arabia, fate would one day give me a chance to be the Laura of Arabia and make me a part of this land which ruled my imagination. I was unaware that I would get this chance to experience this land of the unknown through the lens of my own eyes and I would be able to walk through these places. This story come travelogue begins about around five years ago when fate made Kingdom of Saudi Arabia my new adobe for initially known months and later years to come. Not open to many, Riyadh, the capital of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, didn't welcome tourists at all at that time. So the residents were either the old Bedouins or the people who were brought there by work, followed by their families. I mean, very immediate families to be particular. This move in itself was a challenge to be called the least, although rejoiced to take it up, but also intrigued myself by the mystery and the treasures of the desert that it held within. As defined earlier, my canvas wasn't blank to start with. It had strong impressions of the fairy tales from the past, where Aladdin flew on the flying carpet, and Ali Baba went into the mysterious caves for treasures. From the thoughts of extremely extravagant lifestyles of the Arabs, especially their elites, to having imagined very elaborate palaces of the royals, architecture with humongous bulbous domes and everything made of gold, or at least gold-plated, but it, it didn't take long for this bubble to burst. The only thing that really came close to Aladdin was this Indian restaurant, which has a couple of outlets here and there. Rest was just, just not even close. There were colossal palaces with possibly a lot of gold, but everything is hidden behind high walls and very tall trees. It didn't take much time to realize that Saudis by nature are private people. To the extent that they, they don't even have a picnic, and that they can have an absolute picnic, in absolute wilderness in pitch black night in the middle of nowhere. They don't welcome guests to stay in the private houses even, but arrange for their living in furnished apartments that are available at the corner of every main street. This might be one of the primary reasons that they didn't encourage tourism initially at all, as it didn't come to them naturally. The other strokes that were engraved on the foreground of my canvas were that Riyadh is all about sand and everything that follows is brown with no signs of green. And as it lies in the center of a desert, so not only the environment is sandy but, and brown, but also even the architecture is all just one color. This was surely true, but that's what was the, one can expect from a city that's built in the center of a desert. But as an architect, it was very appealing to experience. To f it felt that the buildings actually belonged to the city and that everything was a part of the environment. 
Like any other new city dweller, before stepping foot into any new city, the first thing we do these days is at least we go on the internet and search for the top things to top 10 things to do in the city at least. Although it's not long ago, but the internet didn't, much, didn't offer much insight to these areas as well. Maybe because the authorities weren't much interested to share the information anyway. The top 10 things to do, surprisingly in Riyadh, had a couple of malls in the list or places to eat. And only one fort, and that too, was in the outskirts of Riyadh, but nothing within. The only information that one could find was through one personal blog, only one, available at that time. Coming from Pakistan, when in, where information technology was at its peak, and information was just a click away, physically traveling to places to get information felt like a very new domain. Providentially, in the humble 30 kilo, kilograms of luggage that I was allowed to pack a lifetime with me, I kept five kilos of two books. One out of which was Architecture of Rasim Badran, Narratives of People and Place. It was my companion in the odd hours of the day. Not only the book was good read, was a good read, but it was a joy to look at as well. His sketches and design philosophy really fascinated me. The book exploration led me to the buildings that were actually built in Riyadh by his firm. Out of many of the projects he's done there, he had undertaken, the development where I was led to organically was Old City Diria. Before actually walking into the old city, let's see what it holds uh, in the history. Diria is a town that lies in the northwestern outskirts of Riyadh. The old city Diria lies um, on either side of the narrow valley known as the Wadi Hanifa, which continues southwards through Riyadh and beyond, comprising almost entirely of mud brick structure. The ruins are apparently in two districts, Al Bujeri and Turaif. Turaif is the highest, and its bottom is easily accessible to the tourists by foot. Part of the old city wall exists running, running all along the edges of the wadi, along with some short observation towers as well. Diria has a fascinating history. Its history has been found in books dated as back as the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. During this era, an expedition took place in 1627. A unit of 30 Muslims were dispatched on a military mission. It headed for the habitation of the Kurata, a sept of the Bakr clan. The Muslims captured the area and returned with war booty. This location is sometimes also identified with an ancient settlement known as the Ghabra, but the proper written history dates back to 15th century. As per the chronicles of the Najat, the city was founded in 1446 uh, by the ancestor of the now royal family. They later left the area at some unknown date. It was the seat of the first royal dynasty in 1744, but it came to a bloodstained end in 1818 when it was besieged by the Ottoman Saudi War. It was the first capital of Emirate of Diria the first Saudi dynasty. It's the place where Sheikh Abdul Wahab gave, gave rise to Wahhabism. It was neglected in the 20th century and came back in somewhat limelight when King Abdullah recently decided that it should be renovated and preserved. And as such, is the largest heritage program in the kingdom. The plans for it are so impressive that UNESCO have declared it a World Heritage Site. Diria, five years back, was one of the only few places that were preserved in its actual form and actually welcomed locals and tourists both and had some reflection of the past. Situated in the center of a verdant oasis with city replete and spectacular mud brick architecture and sultry palm lined avenues. This for me was one of the Saudi's most spectacular yet ultimately little known historic sites at least till then. This, there are two sides of this site, one religious and one secular. This mirrors the past with the Al Saud on one side of the Wadi, whilst the Al, Al Wahhab were on the other. Through this close proximity, they arrived on the way forward for the unification of the Saudi state. As we start our experience, the journey from the main piazza of the Al Bujeri area, despite the time of the day or season of the year, a cool breeze whispers through the labyrinth alleyways, countering the rising heat of the noontime sun, a combination of broad and narrow corridors plays with light and shadow as you walk by. Here and there, beams of light stream through distinctive triangle apertures, which pierce the walls as we photograph the integrate mud brick structures. There's a lulling hush that speaks of timelessness, or rather the futility of measures, measuring minutes in a place that has witnessed centuries of humanity. This and other calm passage leads to the Masjid of Sheikh Abdul Bahab. The mosque has been restored with a few elements from the past, with roofs made of timber logs and straw, and the appearance has been preserved as it is. I couldn't take pictures of the male side much because I was only allowed to peep in, so pictures weren't allowed. 
The adobe construction of the city was the most interesting. The entire city was constructed using wattle and daub made from straw and palm fronds. Once dried, the concussion is extremely resilient. The city has weathered many violent storms and still looks pristine. Many of the modern buildings in Riyadh fare less well. The main plaza, Piazza, on a hill overlooks at the oasis as, as well as the Turaif district. This site is being restored now. With the terraces, restaurants, and shops where, where people can come and soak some of the atmosphere of the site in a traditional environment, the field definitely highlights the culture of the heritage. Various points to stop, reflect, and ponder. Terraces followed by water streams, which are filled with water in the rare rainy, rainy season of Riyadh, as well as lit passageways for the rest of the year. The traditional Arabic Najat door, in muted as well as bright colors, entranceways inviting guests with bukhur. Walkways shaded by palm trees here and there. The, the path finally leads to the old preserved well with the main planks made out of palm trees, tr palm tree trunks, the traditional jute rope, and the bucket made up of camel leather, like they used to do in old ti olden times. On a hot summer day, the temptation to drink is hard to stop. All the paths eventually lead to a slanting roof that is purp purposefully designed to act as the main public plaza. The culmination point, the climb, might feel a little steep for the ones who don't want the extra push, but the view at the top and the glass cube transparent interventions in between are definitely worth the effort. The top roof gardens overlook the whole city, offering views of the ancient mud city and also providing a sense of calm and serenity. Jerry in Zirilio, CEO of Diria Gate Development Authority, previously the CEO of Forbes Travel Guide, says, and I quote, there is something about the place that resonates. They also ask, why is it such a secret, unquote. He further states emphatically that this is the equivalency of Acropolis of the Greece and the Colosseum to the Romans, that this is the Machu Picchu of the Arabian Peninsula. It's of the same significance historically and architecturally. Unquote. This the city was kilometers long and at one time had 30,000 people living in it. It is the largest mud heritage city in the world, much larger than Timbuktu. Recently, as per the Saudi Vision 2030, massive changes are underway throughout the kingdom, and a lot uh, a lot is being done to restore and once the once remains of the of the mud houses. The restoration is very clearly delineate, delineated with the score brick pattern and the superstructure and facilities that are needed to welcome people to cultural heritage site and a modern but sensitively integrated one. This upcoming project will be open to general public possibly by mid-2020, as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is poised to celebrate its 90th anniversary. There are numerous signs that the entire country is open for business and tourism. In the end, it would be difficult to say that where the architecture of Riyadh is heading to, what emotions we attach to it, now and whether the future will align with the past culture and the Muslim expectations or not. But there is one thing that can be said with experience, that this sandy desert does offer tranquil peace and soul and can be easily called home. Thank you. Thank you, architect Sadia. Our final speaker of the day is architect.